Ladies and gentlemen, for our next session, step back in time and immerse yourself in the compelling story of India's anti-colonial movements and the valor of the Indian Armed Forces from the 19th century to the independence era. Fueled by exploitation and draconian laws, this historic battle bore witness to fiery protests and unwavering non-violent resistance orchestrated by iconic figures such as Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Subhash Chandra Bose and Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel. Ladies and gentlemen, this captivating session not only explores how various movements in India ignited the flames of liberation worldwide, but also how they paved the path to India's resounding independence in 1947. And now I would like to invite my panelists on stage, Mr. Pramod Kapoor, founder and publisher of Roly Books. I'd request you all to please welcome all our esteemed panelists with a round of applause. Major General V.K. Singh retired, former Chief Signal Officer, Western Command. He also served as Cabinet Secretariat Law, Raw. And Dr. Jyoti Atwal, Associate Professor of Modern Indian History at Center for Historical Studies at GNU. And to conduct this session, I'd like to call on stage Dr. Indivar Kamtekar, Associate Professor, GNU. He's a senior fellow at the Prime Minister's Museum and Library. His current research project explores the multifaceted long-term transformations in state power initiated by the events of the 1940s in India. His previous research on the deep impact of the Second World War introduced a comparative international dimension in the study of the Indian political, social, and economic history of that period. I'd request all our panelists to please join us on stage. So uh, without further ado, I think more people will come in, but uh, I've been asked by the organizers to start the session. Today in this panel, we are going to discuss three books, three recent books published 2021 and 2022. I'm following the instructions of the organizers who have said keep intros to the minimum Details of speakers are available on the website, so you can look them up on your mobiles if you wish. Let me quickly introduce the speakers. Suffice it to say, very briefly, that our first speaker is Sri Pramod Kapoor. He is the well-known founder and publisher of Roli Books. He is also a curator of exhibitions, a recipient of high honors from India and abroad, and an author of several books, among which is this book we are going to discuss today, 1946, Last War of Independence, Royal Indian Navy Mutiny. That's what he's going to tell us about today. It's a book which, I should say, reveals his bloodhound-like ability to follow the trail of a rich historical story and to grab every possible detail of it. It's amazing the tenacity and uh, the kind of way he has followed this story in all its details. Our second speaker will be Major General V.K. Singh. He was in the Corps of Signals and has served as a teacher and educator in our major military training institutions. He is a man of many parts. He has also, as uh, was just mentioned, he served in the Cabinet Secretariat in RAW in the research and analysis wing. He is interested in sports, in journalism, and in military history, of course. Today, he's going to talk about his book on the Jabalpur mutiny of February, March, 1946. The title of the book is The Contribution of the Jabalpur Mutiny to India's Freedom. Did the INA also have a role? Uh, he brings in what happened in the Signal Corps in counterposition to the INA. And about the INA, I should mention that he has very dismissive and scathing remarks, which would be very controversial, uh, which shows that Professor Singh believes in many forms of combat. One of them is between versions of history. One prioritizes the INA, and he's willing to fight it out on that version. Our third speaker, Dr. Jyoti Atwal, teaches at the Center for Historical Studies of JNU. She's a specialist in the studies of gender, sociocultural history, and anti-imperialist movements. She has authored a book titled Real and Imagined Widows, Gender Relations in Colonial North India. Um, and the book she's going to talk about today, which she has edited, is called 
India-Ireland and anti-imperial struggle, remembering the Connaught Rangers mutiny, 1920. Uh, this book was publication was supported by the Embassy of Ireland in Delhi, um, and it's uh, um, there is the incident of the execution of the 21-year-old Private James Daly um, for his part in the mutiny of 1920. 13 other people were sentenced to death, but uh, their sentences were commuted. So there is the whole issue of you have these Irish people in, um, in India, and there are all kinds of questions. What did they think about India? We know that the Irish soldiers could be quite brutal, for example, when they crushed the Mopla rebellion in 1920-21. So anti-imperialism here is a complex matter. She'll speak to us today about what her research reveals. To keep to time, again, the organizers have told me to be very strict, so you'll forgive me if I am. Um, each panelist will have 15 minutes to talk about the guts or essence of their book, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So to look at this in another way, our distinguished panel today consists of a publisher, a soldier, and a scholar. Publisher, soldier, scholar could be a kind of alternative title for this panel. Um, and of course, I'm your moderate moderator. Let me call upon the publisher to speak first. Sri Pr Pramod Kapoor, over to you. Well, friends, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for including my book in, the, in this inaugural uh, military lit fest. Uh, I'm indeed very honored to be present here among the scholars whom I have always uh, published. And uh, I've, I always said that they are the ones who educate. Publishers are the ones who entertain. So they are, in many ways, um, have a superior position. I, am, I slowly try to sort of sneak into there. And, and I don't know if, if, if uh, but going from the success of the book, I suppose I've succeeded uh, somewhat. Now, today happens to be a very important day, at least as far as my study goes. Um, exactly 80 years ago, on 21st October 1943, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose had declared India independent from um, the British rule in, in Singapore. So that, in that respect, I feel um, that uh, it's a very important day for, as far as my reading and my thesis goes. Um, there was a film that was supposed to be shown, so I'm wondering whether it's, uh, because that sets the tone for the book and for, I don't, otherwise I've, you know, I've done some seven, eight years of research and, and yes, so there it is.
but I must have seen this film at least hundred times after it was made, and uh, and um, and while it was being made, I had a lot to do with it. But every time I see it, I I have different shades and different sets of emotions. It's it's sadness, it's anger, it's pride. Um, these were these were young ratings. 16 to 21, who were, as one of the, the, the leader of the ratings called, called themselves, um, it was the mutiny of the innocent, and that was, that was one of the, that is one of the best book on the subject. Um, that it was, uh, it, it, it was started from 1942, after the, um, after the British, um, I mean, after the uh, Quit India movement, when British uh, arrested Gandhiji and many others, and few uh, so-called young Turks went underground, including Aruna Asafali and and others uh, who were of that age. Uh, she, she wouldn't come out. She she would run the. Um, the uh, Freedom uh, Radio. She would um, do all kinds of activi underground activities. And even after her properties were, were confiscated um, and that she went, she, everything that she had in the family was taken away, she, would, she wouldn't come out and she would fight from the underground. It's only in the late 1945 when the leaders were um, were released, that Gandhiji made a appeal to her that uh, saying that, Aruna, I know that you become a skeleton, that I keep getting news about you. You will serve the nation much more if you come out of it. And she came out. And what does she do? She talks to the some of the young ratings who she had got in, uh, in contact with through her friends in, uh, who had served in the Navy. They all used to have uh, uh, almost a weekly meeting in in Rivera building in um, uh, in in Bombay, and there uh, a whole lot of these names that you saw: Prithvi Raj Kapoor and and Khwaja Ahmad Abbas, Ludhianvi. These people would come and address them. Um, they were in a way getting ready for rebellion, and these were. These were such young, um, innocent soldiers that, that they, they, they thought that they should have a role to play in the freedom movement. And therefore, they, they would give the, uh, the Indian Navy or the Royal Indian Navy to, the, uh, to Gandhiji and to, uh, to the leaders on a platter saying, here we are, we, are, we have liberated the armed forces. And this was indeed very naive of them to have thought about that like that. They were, in the beginning, very, uh, they were nonviolent. They followed Gandhiji's uh, uh, advice. I mean, not advice, but Gandhiji's uh, philosophy of being uh, nonviolent. And this is how the, the whole thing started. But the first bullet was fired by the British in Castle Barrack, which is now the Angre in Bombay, which is now really Christian Bomb uh, Angre. And that's when they had to go and, and seize the armory and, 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 and the violence really started from there. Um, it's very difficult to analyze the political situation relating to the armed forces um, now 75, 80 years later. Uh, the, they were hoping that, the, that the, all the political leaders would come to their aid, would give them advice, give them direction. But none of that happened. Gandhiji said that he is not going to, going to comprom compromise with violence. And therefore, uh, he went to Pune. And uh, I don't know whether he was, he was directing Sadar Patel or not, but Sadar Patel from day one started to work on, um, on getting them to surrender 
and, make, and making promises that both Nehruji and, and Sardar Patel was not capable of that time to have kept it because they, we were not independent. And these boys thought that they were, they were uh, giving the armed forces of the British and they were actually, they, you know, mutiny is, is, a, is a wrong word to speak in a military festival. But they, this was a different time. This was a time when, um, when the, uh, they thought they, were, they had had enough with the, with the uh, Indian, uh, British Indian forces and they were going to give it to the mother, mother India for, for uh, uh, armed force and they were going to convert the, the armed forces into that. As I said, they were naive, they were innocent, and they, without uh, getting support from the from uh, from Jinnah, from from Nehruji, or from Sardar Patel, they went ahead in, into this and got involved. Um, not just that, I think later as it progressed, the they were asked to go back at a certain time, three o'clock on on the second day, I think, and uh, go back to the barracks. Um, not all of them uh, could come back, and that is when, uh, after three o'clock, the action started from from the British side. Uh, they, uh, the Ad Admiral Godfrey, who was the Falkland at that time, he, he announced that look, we we will not mind destroying the uh, the navy that we have built with so much uh, passion, uh, but we cannot. Uh, and we cannot tolerate indiscipline here. And here they were, he, he flew in from, from, from Delhi. They were, they were having meetings with him, trying to sort out that these are the demands we have. And it, it had all started with, uh, again, uh, uh, bad food, uh, uh, racial discrimination, the, uh, the parity in pay, etc., and of course, uh, you know, they were inspired by by Netaji Subhash and Bose, whose literature used to keep coming uh, to them from from Singapore and Far East, and they would study it in their liberty time in in the uh, in the cafes and and whenever they went to uh, out of their their barracks. Well, this con uh, this con con continued and um, they had to surrender because a, they couldn't uh, the, they were told that the uh, that the um, uh, that the uh, the british that they they will not be able to face the might of the british forces and and therefore they should they should surrender well, sadar patel uh, prevailed on, on them and and said that you must surrender we promise you no victimization Something that they were they were not uh, capable of keeping that promise. Now, fine, they surrendered, uh, but after they surrendered, within 24 hours, they were taken away to uh, a Mulun, Mulun uh, camp. They were taken to the uh, to Mulun camp, and then some of them who were the, supposed to be the ringleaders were taken to Kalyan, where they were treated in the same shabby manner, etc. And within two months, each one of them, the, the, the about 480 of them were given um, one-way ticket. Uh, they were taken to the, to the railway station, given that ticket, and said, never show your face in Bombay. Now, that is one part. But even after the, the mutiny was over, when we became, in, uh, when we became independent, they wrote to all the, all the leaders. They wrote to Pandit Nehru. They wrote to Sadar Patel. They wrote to Krishna Menon, everyone who mattered at that time, to, to say that, look, we, in fact, one of the letters that, that is in the archive uh, addressed to Pandit Nehru, uh, who was, by the way, very uh, um, sympathetic towards them uh, among all the leaders. But he, he, they, he, uh, they, this, this particular rating wrote to uh, Pandit Nehru that, look, uh, you were a freedom fighter. You were on the street. We were also freedom fighters. We were on the street. We've lost everything. You become prime minister, but you can't even give us a, a job of a simple sailor, you know. But they got, they, all of them got two-line 
um, two-line uh, uh, reply saying that the government and principal has decided not to uh, reinstate anyone who was involved in the mutiny. Um, there may be many, many, many reasons for such thing, but I mean, as a, um, as a non-scholar historian, I would say I take it very simply that probably um, there were, till 1958, we had four Navy chiefs who were British. And these people have rebelled against, against the British and against probably some of those who were, well, I, I suppose not all of them were in the, in the RIN here, but they were not given any, uh, any position and they really died. Uh, and most of them, uh, other than those who were very bright and who actually, there are some who uh, worked with Biju Patnai to open Kalinga Airways and, and few others, but most of them d died in poverty. That is what happened. And this is the story of, of my book. I'm open to any um, questions or? So now we move on to the Jabalpur mutiny and uh, the also assessment of the INA, which is involved, linked in the capable hands of Major General P.K. Singh. I hope I'm audible. Okay. Uh, now, you know, this book, which we are going to discuss, this is the title of the book. Now, in this book, I have discussed three mutinies, the naval mutiny, the army mutiny, and the Air Force mutiny. I have also discussed the Indian National Army's role. Unfortunately, because of time, I'm going to not cover all of them. I'll be mainly covering the army mutiny because that has not been written. It has been written earlier, but uh, it's not been made public. It, it was, uh, you know, first written by me in the Regimental History of Signals in 2005. Then later it was written in 2009 in this book uh, for a USI publication after a research project the army mutiny as well as the naval mutiny have been covered in this. These books are not available on sale to the public or in Amazon, so most people don't know about it. And so that is the reason I decided to you know, write a book on my own. Because there were a number of people whom I had interviewed while writing the army and the naval, naval mutiny. Uh, they are there in this book but uh, now they have passed away. So we'll first start with the Jabalpur mutiny. Next slide, please. This is just a brief salient feature of the mutiny. It just lasted about a week. About 1,700 men were involved. It was peaceful, no violence by participants, suppressed by the use of force. No firing, but a bayonet charge. 70 men injured and three dead. Next. Now, before I go on, mutiny is mutiny. In the armed forces, there is nothing called a strike or an uprising, etc. A mutiny is always a mutiny. Collective insubordination by two or more men is mutiny, and that is the way they are to be treated, and they were treated. What we want, want to discuss is the contribution of the event. They were guilty of mutiny, but that event, that mutiny itself, played a part later when the Britishers had to decide to leave India. Now, here I am just giving you a brief uh, overview. What was there in Jabalpur? Most people don't know. In Jabalpur, we have a signal training center, which is still there. We also have our depot and records. And at that time, in 1946, it came under Jabalpur area, which came under Nagpur district, and came under Central Command, which was then at Agra. Next. Now, the background. These are similar to what happened to the naval beauty. Low quality, condiments, rations, corruption in the local 
purchase of rations. The general living standards were very poor. No, all, all these came out later in an inquiry which was held. Most officers were British. Unlike in the units of the Indian Army, where there was very close contact and there were a lot of Indian officers. By the time this happened, Indian officers had returned to the rank of brigadier also. But in the center in Jabalpur, there was very little contact with them. And the very casual attitude of the supervisory staff, some of them had been there for years and years. And the main thing is that the people who are being trained there are from technical trades. You know, similar thing if you see happened in Talwar, where they were all wireless operators and so. Here also, the men who mutinied were from the technical trades, mechanics, electricians. They were more educated. They could make out what is happening in the country. And they were worried that the war is ended and we have got no future. So why are we wasting our time here? OK, next. Now, the first signs of trouble, mutiny started on 27th. But on 26th itself, there were first signs of trouble when they, some posters were you know, seen on the walls with giant written. And uh, they say, we'll uh, shed blood if required, and so and so. That the officers immediately came to know of it, and they took action. That uh, Colonel Gelson, who was the commandant, he straight away went and met the area commander and told him this is what is happening. Mutiny had not started, but they got an inkling that something will happen. And they had a, a conference in the evening. In the evening, all the men were paraded. They attended the parade and then went back. Nothing happened. Next day. Next slide. Now, on 27th, you see there were 200 trainees. They, you know, attended the morning parade, but after breakfast, they all made a procession and started shouting slogans, Jai Hind, Jai Hind, and Kalab Zindabad carrying flags of the Congress Party and the Muslim League, and they marched over the city. The officers tried to stop them, officers as well as VCOs, now called JCOs, but they just brushed them aside. They reached a place called Telak Bhumi. They had a meeting there. They had met some uh, people from the Congress Party and Muslim League. But in the evening, they started back. They came down came back to the unit area and sat down. By this time, two companies of uh, battalion 27 by 9 yards had been mobilized. The commandant and the area commander came in and addressed them, and they were told that you are all under arrest. But he told them, don't worry, your grievances will forward. And they fell in and were marched to the STC cage. There was a cage made for keeping these people, and they were all there. and. They spend the night there. Next. Now, this was an ultimatum. They called it an ultimatum, typewritten. They were all educated. They used to operate uh, teleprinters and typewriters, which they handed over on 27th to the senior officers. This was forwarded next day to the area headquarters. Refused to be treated as slaves. English soldiers get better treatment and better pay, demobilization to be speeded up, protest against the firing in Bombay, Karachi, and Calcutta. By this time, the naval mutiny had started in Bombay. Protest against the victory celebrations in view of the food crisis, and demand release of all INA personnel, including Abdul Rashid and Burhanuddin. Now, these people from INA who are being tried now were not uh, being tried like the first three for uh, waging war against the key. These were being tried for atrocities, for torturing other INS soldiers. General Karyapa was the presiding officer of the GCM of Burhanuddin, and he gave him seven years imprisonment. They were actually, uh, uh, did not deserve any mercy as it is. 
but uh, the the they felt that punishments are very harsh so that was added in one, one of the demands next slide now the next day what happened a british battalion was called in because this jhat battalion they found they are not ready to act they haven't been ordered to fire or something but they got the feeling that they may not um, act against the indian soldiers they got a british battalion and about 80 men from the battalion started going on the same route they had gone yesterday they were intercepted by the british battalion and brought back uh, similarly 20 200 clerks also collected at another place they were joined by troops from another unit they sat down and no violence so far they were only demanding release of their colleagues and so and so next slide now on 28th the district commander himself came major general skinner and it was decided to arrest the ling leaders the two ic of the jars and kunus entered the cage and asked them to surrender but they did not allow those who wanted to surrender then it was decided to carry out the arrest by force 80 soldiers of the british battalion entered the cage with fixed bayonets the men were physically removed a lot of shouting and with because of the bayonets and the weight of the you know men who were gathering to one corner the cage gave way and broke large number managed to escape through the gap and some got involved in a scuffle some were injured because of the bayonets and were trampled those who escaped were of course later brought back they were caught and brought back next day another infantry battalion was called first royal gurkhas another 50 men marched through the cage bent to the market sadar bazar shouting slogans this was reported in the newspapers the papers reported that three men had been killed in the bayonet charge and 70 were injured now this caused a lot of uh, you know resentment and the district magistrate declared it a restricted area but during the next two days situation improved next on uh, 3rd march a cordon was placed around stc area commander spoke to the men asked them to return to work they agreed and came back to work and after that you can say the mutiny finished next now the reasons for the disfaction were analyzed the vcos and ncos who had spent more than 2 years were posted out some had spent 9 10 years in the same place the number of indian officers was increased 85 men were found to have been actively involved in the mutiny 18 were tried by some regional court martial 15 were sentenced to dismissal and imprisonment 3 were acquitted seven were dismissed from service without trial and 19 discharged without terminal benefit and 41 were discharged on administrative grounds without an inquiry on this some others were also sent home now they had put in long years of service and poor chaps they died in penury now just as a matter of interest when i learned when i was doing this project I learned that the Indian Navy personnel have got freedom fighters pension. There were 576 of them. They were sanctioned pension. So I said these people should also get. I mean, uh, they have also taken part in a mutiny. I am not sympathy for the mutineers, but there should be no discrimination between the two. And uh, after a lot of going up and down, the. Uh, i am excluding those who were sentenced etc it is only those who were uh, discharged on administrative grounds by this time happened about 25 of them were now in pakistan around 20 odd were left in india the movement was not sanctioned as a freedom fighter movement by the then home minister shri advani ji he said okay those who are available they can be given pension 
but we were not able to trace even one of them. They were either dead or they were untraceable. Anyway, next slide. Now, they were, uh, now just see the views of the political leaders at that time. Under Jawaharlal Nehru, he said the men have remained completely peaceful, demands of a better treatment in regard to racial and amenities. There were also some political demands, such as such demands should not be made on the basis of a strike. We have seen recently strike by American and British shows. Next slide. Now, this is an important letter which has been also referred to in the other book, which Lord Wavell wrote to the king at that time, pointing out that there has been a lot of disaffection. Mutiny in the Royal Indian Navy, lot of indiscipline in the array of some unrest in the army. The most disturbing feature of all that unrest is beginning to appear some units of the Indian Army. So far only in the technical arms. You see, they, this army thing literally caused them a lot of um, you know, headache, which you'll see. Next. Now, the Viceroy asked uh, Sir J. Thorne, home member, to make a brief appreciation of the situation on what would happen. As you know, the cabinet mission was then in India, negotiating the Crips mission on, with the political leaders, the terms of uh, granting freedom. And he was asked to appreciate what will happen if the mission does not achieve a settlement. And one was, he was to see whether the armed forces will remain loyal or not. That was the important point to be, you know, seen. And if, as you can see, especially what I have highlighted, he says, if faced with the prospect of firing on mobs, not all units could be relied on. RIF, RIN, and signals units. There will be downright mutiny in these. This is, and Thorn suggested that an apparition be prepared by the War Department. Next slide. The director of military intelligence, naturally, he was asked to carry out an assessment on the report of Mr. Thorn. This is what he has written. The reliability of the Indian services in respect of Congress inspired troubles. Armored Corps, gunners, sappers, and infantry can in the main be depended upon. As you know, the army has got five arms. Armored Corps, artillery, engineers, infantry, and signals. The fifth arm, that is signals, they said cannot be considered reliable. Which is a very serious comment. And then the Royal Indian Navy cannot be regarded as reliable. That also was added. Next. After this, the cabinet mission then carried out their own assessment and appreciation. They made a number of plans of what will happen if the, the agreement is not reached. A breakdown plan was to be made. There were five uh, different options. Complete withdrawal from India as soon as possible. Withdrawal by a certain date. Appeal to the United Nations, maintaining overall control and giving independence to southern and central India. So finally, they recommended the last option because they said we cannot keep the whole country under control and there might be civil war, a lot of British lives will be lost. But the mutiny is based, you know, in these states, which now you can say present uh, UP, Bihar and southwards, all that area. And they will stay in the northwest, northwest frontier. Next. Now this thing went to London. In the London, it was considered by the Chief of Staff Committee. The Chief of Staff Committee, they didn't want to lose India. They wanted to, for strategic reasons, maintain the hold somehow. But they said, 
if the armed forces did not remain royal, five British divisions will be required, additional divisions. And this meant that they would have to start fresh recruitment of British troops, which at that time would have caused a mutiny maybe in the British Army. People were being repatriated every day from all over the world. So then they realized it can't be done. Next. Then, after this, Okinle wrote this on the military aspects of the plan. The importance of keeping the Indian Army steady is emphasized. On it depends the stability of the country. Okay. The statements of the RIN and the IF are less important. Next. So I'll just spend two minutes on the naval beauty. Huh? I know, but uh, these are different aspects. Okay, uh, uh, what I wanted to touch on, just go to the last three slides. Last. You know, um, incidentally, there have been mutinies in the Royal Indian Navy throughout the Second World War. In 42, next, next. And throughout 44, 45, next. 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 Next, these were the demands. These are the views of Mahatma Gandhi. Next. Now, I interviewed three officers who were there on the ships when the mutiny took place. This is Commodore R.P. Khanna. He was serving on board the ship written. Now, their views are different from the mutineers' views. You see, everywhere we are hearing that it was bad food, bad food. They are saying, no, it is the anti-British, it is the ill-treatment by the British. See, the first line was not bad food by ill-treatment by British officers. There was no national angle at that time. There was a strong anti-British feeling, which is the root cause of the mutiny. There was no effect of the INMA, only national feeling. Next. This is uh, Commodore Inder Singh. Of course, Inder Singh, uh, well known, he was sent to uh, negotiate also. But here again he was saying disaffection was due to maltreatment of India's sailors by the British officers of RIN. The British officers were very arrogant and diehards. Next. And this is Commodore B.K. Dung. In his ship, the sailors locked up the CO and a number of other officers. B.K. Dung spoke to the men, etc., convinced them that nothing will be achieved. What is the use of locking him up? You know, we'll, let us read Vizag, then we'll see what can be done. So he says that uh, the feeling was a resentment being against British officers. Mutiny did not start as a freedom movement. Politics entered only later. It was basically a food complaint badly handled by S.N. Kohli. Provocative response of Kohli aggravated the situation. Next. That's about all. Thank you very much, sir. I'll now ask Dr. Atwal to speak, please. A very good afternoon to everyone. Um, and I'm very grateful to the organizers for having me here. And uh, also, uh, it manifests some of the scholarship, great scholarship that has come together by being associated with uh, USA and other institutions which do military research. And I'm very indebted to them that they have approached, you know, uh, Center for Historical Studies and uh, chosen to uh, collaborate with us for this uh, project, which I'm going to talk to you about, this book that is the outcome of that. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Indira Kamteka, who's chairing the session. Thank you, sir. Uh, and all to the co-panelists um, uh, who made a, uh, brilliant presentation and uh, 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 it speaks volumes about how much has gone into how much research is also needed and how much passionately some research has gone into mutiny rethinking the idea of the mutiny so uh, let me uh, present before you due to the time constraints some of the aspects that were covered in this book um, uh, 
And while uh, this book was, uh, could you move to the second slide, please? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I will start my presentation with uh, a Punjabi quote. Kha kha goliya raj nu kaim kita. Zalam Nazaraya Dagedar Sanu. This is from 1920 Chand, which was discussing, sorry, 1930 Chand, which was the Chand journal, which was discussing the, uh, discussing the mutinies and treatment of the revolutionaries at the hands of the British. And it, this one particular line, one particular, uh, you know, poem stays, says everything about, uh, what we, about the feeling that was prevailing at that time, that while we served the British, we had served, we had served with life. We've died for them, taking the bullets, but they have cheated us. So the feeling was very strong that they have cheated us by 1930. And this is particularly regarding the First World War, uh, the promises that were made, and also Jallianwala Bagh, and also uh, the growing popularity of Gandhiji, and also the other methods the other demands which were not met. Uh, I think uh, we don't have to go to the nationalist history, the history of the freedom movement, the causes of other discontent. Without that, moving into that, I would just take one and two minutes to talk to you about why Ireland, how did it evolve? How did this become a project? And how did Ireland focus, figure, how does it figure in this particular idea of the mutiny? And the mutiny that we discussed in the conference that was held in 2020 was a mutiny, which was actually a mutiny by the Irish soldiers and not Indian soldiers. So how does it, what does it mean for Indian history? What does it mean for Irish history? And most importantly, transnational histories, which, which we see as the collaborative future of so many histories that some of us are doing. Um, this particular idea, came to, uh, emerged in uh, Ambassador Mackelder's room in January 19, uh, January, <laughs> sorry about the date, January 2019, um, when I was heading for Ireland in June and I was visiting him just to apprise him what I'm going to be doing. And he said, do you have any idea this is coming up? Can we do a something on it? And I had no clue about this, Connaught Rangers mutiny. I must admit, I'm not a military historian. I mean, uh, you know, I have, I'm, I'm very uh, honored to be here. Rana Chinnaji has uh, very graciously invited me to present. And um, also Adil Chinna has a wonderful article in this, in this volume, which of course uh, is one of the best. So I uh, basically, so, uh, this idea emerged there that we don't even know what has happened in, in this far land and how has other how have other uh, nations which are now nations struggled against independent against british rule for their independence so while a lot of work has been done quite a lot of work has been done on gadar party its relationship with de valera its relationship with ira etc but we don't really know what happened in india india how did india become a theater that was something which we were opening up through this particular study of this mutiny. And uh, what happened in this mutiny, I'll just briefly tell you, because many people do not, are not aware of what happened. Uh, so exactly what happened was on 2nd November 1920, uh, James, uh, a mutiny broke out uh, in, the, in, in, in different battalions of Kadot, uh, called Connaught Rangers in Solon, and Jalandhar. These were the two, two uh, places where they were stationed. And as a result of the mutiny, which I'll come to, uh, there were some people who were ident this is This is typically Irish uh, contingent. Uh, and they, many of them, 48 of them, were actually sentenced to imprisonment after that. What did they do? They downed the arms. They said, we won't. They refused to serve. and. Uh, this was another, uh, this, this was supposed to be one of the 
important events, and 48 of them were given sentence. But at the same time, about 19 of them were sentenced to death. But eventually, 18 were let off with another other punishments of deportation back to either uh, Ireland or to England in various jails. And given the fact that Ireland also suffered under the colonial rule, uh, like India, there was a commonality. And so they had by that time figured out maybe it was a wrong decision to send this contingent here. But they were relatively stationed in a remote area. They were not really stationed in a busy area or a very you know actively engaged in wars, uh, for that matter. But the fact that they were together in that contingent mattered. And as they also found the flag being the Irish Republican flag being smuggled in somehow. Now things were being smuggled in. We all know that 1920 was a time when a lot of things were happening with uh, German assistance, uh, with also happening with other kind of uh, revolutionary assistance, localized or international, in the international war, global uh, assistance. Uh, this is very, the way I use global is very different from the way we use it today. So wha what was upheaval about? Upheaval was about James Daly, who was the only soldier, actually. One of them was shot dead while he was trying to run, but the other was uh, actually sentenced to death. And the man, this was, uh, James Daly was a 21-year-old private soldier from County Westmeath, who had served in the Great War, which is the First World War, before re-enlisting in the Connaught Rangers in 1919. And there were 13 other soldiers of his battalion who played a prominent role in the mutiny at Jalandhar and Solon. And they were also sentenced, as I said, by court-martial. And um, most returned... Most of the mutineers, they returned to a newly independent Ireland in 1923 because that was the time when Connaught Rangers were disbanded uh, by the king. Very, and Ireland had changed very much by that time. And they were in the middle of a civil war, basically, deciding which part of Ireland was to be with, you, with Britain and which was to be with Republican Ireland. Yet the return of the Irishmen from military service in British colors was was, as one of our authors puts it, scarcely a novelty in itself. In the course of the 19th century, Ireland had become a mainstay of Britain's armed forces. And if we go back a little bit to what we, uh, this is uh, what you see here is uh, Renmore Barracks, which is one of the recruiting grounds of the Connaught Rangers. The other was King's House. And uh, uh, we have had several exhibitions at King's House talking about uh, how uh, many of these uh, soldiers went to India. And whenever I visit Ireland, I have people coming to me and showing me their great, their grandfather's, great grandfather's collection, which uh, could include a piece of ivory, coin, uh, you know, things, small things like that. But it is a memorabilia from India, which they remember. Now, uh, next slide, please. Now, this is a very interesting painting by, eight, uh, by Lady Butler, 1877. And uh, this has partly been used in the cover of the book. We've given it, we've fused it with other images. This is a very telling picture of, uh, this is the typical Irish youth that would be recruited from the village, the small, the small towns nearby. And uh, they would be either Catholic or Protestants, mostly Catholic. Uh, even Protestants were, uh, would be, it's very difficult, to, would be very difficult to distinguish between them. Uh, could we have the second slide, please? Could we have the next slide, please? Yeah, these would be the, very quickly just taking you through this visual tour, and then I'll come back to the, some of the points I make regarding in the book. Um, these would be the typical uniforms, uh, very warm for Indian weather, as you can see. But what, if, what is very interesting is that soldiers were introduced and, owned or, uh, and also orientalized. As you can see, there's a little elephant, the collar, so, so as to make them feel royal, identify with a, something powerful and very exotic Indian animal. 
So these were some of the things which uh, are there in the Renmore barracks today. And uh, there's a separate museum of the Connaught Rangers. And uh, uh, so next slide, please. Uh, this would be a very, uh, this would probably be a cup for winning uh, in some kind of uh, match, uh, not clear which one. But it is a silver from India, and it is, a, it is, it is, it is there in the museum. So I couldn't really, I, even the curators didn't, couldn't tell me properly what it was for and how it, was, it found its way there. And also this would be the drum of the, of the contingent of the, uh, and this would, the fact that uh, these had the names of uh, different uh, countries that they had served in. Uh, so as you can see, there was a lot of pride invested in this contingent. And the army or any other contingent had to be filled with a lot of pride of serving the other. And we've, we've heard other speakers talk about the brutality even of the Irish uh, soldiers or others on, uh, in, in India. Well, there are, of course, uh, this is uh, coloni the colonizing by the colonized, of course, that thesis is very much relevant to Ireland, but I think we look at some other aspects of it to not just stick to some uh, usual ones. Next, please. Next slide, please. So uh, the person sitting on the right-hand side is James Daly. This would this probably taken after they arrived in India. This is the this is something. Uh, this is a picture taken there. Uh, so. Just a few highlights, and then I'll move on to the. Uh, the Irish nationalist leaders and sailors actually gave no trouble, even after the 1916 rising, and the threat of conscription in 1918, which outraged nationalist Ireland, with the exception of the protests mounted by the Connaught Rangers at Jalandhar and Solon. In Irishmen serving in British colors made no trouble up to 1922. Uh, but this was, uh, this was because they were duly punished. Uh, one execution and deportation of all then disbanding the whole unit was one of the everlasting effects, had some effects. Um, but in Ireland, in the last 15 years, we've seen an archival revolution with the release of the two set of records which are absolutely central to the history of independence movement. The 1773 witnesses statements collected from the veterans by Bureau of Military History between 1947 and 1956 and the vast military service pension collection of over 300,000 files. They're placed online to maximize public access. So people who actually were not heard began to be heard in between 1947 and 1956. Our knowledge of Connaught Rangers has been reconstituted through these records. So there's a lot of problem with these records. As historians, we don't see them as sacrosanct because they were actually, there were two kinds of army in Ireland, in colonial Ireland. One. IRA, Irish Volunteers, Irish Republican Brotherhood, they all had uniforms, they all had ranks. And these were revolutionaries who exist, coexisted with the alternative British army. So when Brit Ireland got its independence, uh, it was the issue of the pension which became very important. It was the members of the IRA, Irish Republican Brotherhood and Volunteers who actually got the pension. Uh, through testimonies after they were proven that they had they had been there and records were looked through that they had actually gone to jail etc or pensions were given to those descendants who had lost whose whose uh, whose uh, uncle or whose uh, son or whose um, father had actually been martyred in the cause of freedom, somewhat like our own case, but slightly different. Because here the claimants, what, would, what was to happen to those then who served in the British Army? What was to happen to them? They literally had no pension. So this was another problem that arose. And so only through the evidence of the mutiny, uh, only through the evidence of the mutiny, we could really um, 
you know, they could prove that they had served the country. So they had to prove they were part of the mutiny. That was the pressure actually on them because the families needed pension by 1920s, 30s and 40s, which saw, of course, which was uh, uh, also uh, a very challenging economic phase for Ireland. So this is how the records were you know, we, we can't really trust those records, and many historians have back, gone back and forth. But in case of mutiny that we discussed, uh, the question is, was the question was, uh, could you, next slide, please. The question was, do we, do these people, what was this mutiny about? Was it about independence of Ireland? What is about, was it a Republican uh, uh, emotion? Or was it just, as has been mentioned in the Jabalpur case, because of uh, bad food, because of bad, bad arrangements, bad officials? So this was not because of bad officials only. The whole thing was coming from Ireland. The fact that Irish people had been treated very badly. But of course, we have evidence that many of them were also drinking. Many of these soldiers had been drinking. But then that would be a normal general practice in the evening. You can't be blaming them for drinking and then mutinying after that. So this was, these are some of the issues which are, you know, which are record-based, interpretation-based. And uh, the position that we've taken in the book is that we're open to all interpretations of the mutiny. We have looked at the demilitarization aspect, which has been raised by our author, Mario Draper, who said that it's, uh, the mutiny was an outcome of demilitarization. And also the fact that they went back home, they were not satisfied. And you know, after, the, after the First World War, this was bound to happen. And there was violence in the colonies after that. There was violence where, in the places where these soldiers went back to. Uh, I think we've, we've countered that effectively in this, that we have his essay, but we've countered that by showing, please can we have the next, uh, the, can you just uh, move on to the next one, please? Uh, the last, uh, some of them, please, could you go on? Yes. Yeah, 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 uh, the previous one, the sketch, we like the sketch. These are some of the sketches from the scrapbook of the of the soldiers who were in Dagshai prison. This was the prison, which was a medieval prison, where all these mutineers were, um, uh, were kept for almost six, seven months before they were deported and tried, um, with the exception that one was actually sent, executed in Dagshai. Uh, so through these scrapbooks, they're highly political. There's a high, highly politicized sense of how they have absorbed politics. They understand the role of Britain, they understand the role of Ireland and America in this. And so we found these in the National Library of Ireland. These scrapbooks are very telling. They've, done, they've been done by anonymous soldiers, but they're all Irish because they were in Ireland and they were taken back home. Uh, could you please, uh, yeah. So this is describing their own life. This is describing their evenings and uh, last days of Pompeii. Uh, they're imagining uh, a lot of things there, very political in there. Uh, I won't go into really details, it is there in the book. We've introduced these in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the introduction, uh, how they're very political. Yeah. So these are some of the images, but what, is, what was very, very important and interesting in this is that uh, this mutiny was being reimagined even after the mutiny had happened. And <coughs> it had actually very little impact on the Indian scenario. I have not really found a single newspaper in India which has mentioned this mutiny. I think it was so silent in that sense. The British wouldn't, wouldn't want anybody to know about it. Uh, so the mutiny didn't really find a resonance here. but. It is the aftermath. It is the reimagining of the mutiny. It is now uh, you, when you, if you, if you ever happen to go to Solon, <coughs> you'll find near, yes, very close to Solon, this dark shy prison, and it's open to visitors. And it has been curated. And one of the rooms in the prison has now been designated as the Gandhi room. There is a. I am, we are not sure as historians whether this really happened, but Gandhi is supposed to have visited these Irish soldiers 
and stayed there in the prison for one night. There is no proof of that, but possibly. We can't dismiss that also. So these are some of the claims that have been made and where they are very interesting. This is the urge, the urge for India and Irish public and historians to actually forge a common past, to look at their connected past, not as totally contentious and totally full of, uh, you know, uh, colonial violence on one side with General Dwyer, Dwyer as one of the main uh, villains of Ireland to Indian his for Indian history, but uh, just I shall end with the with with the. Uh, we have a I have some I had some slides for this for the <coughs> for showing you the connections the Irish uh, connections with Ireland Irish connections with India the revolutionary connections but I think I'll keep that for Q and A, and uh, so this particular in in the book our our main focus was to bring Ireland out not as particularly um, either as hero heroic to us or uh, oppressive to us but as some uh, as as but you to see uh, to see how India was a theater for many of them to actually enact their social their revolution and to actually enact their nationalist method uh, to to check their nationalist methodology through uh, a mutiny which of course uh, died uh, in the newspapers in Ireland. Thank you very much. Um, let us uh, take up, we've had three rich talks and um, let me, by way of starting, before anybody wishes to ask a question, um, put this through what I might call a professional filter. Historians, writers of any kind often make propositions. As historians, we ask, what is the clinching evidence for that proposition? Now, in each of these cases, you will see that the speaker has made various propositions. The mere fact that you say that this is the last war of independence is in itself contains a viewpoint of history. Who saw it as the last war of independence? Quit India movement, Karinge ya Maringe, was the last war of independence as seen by, wrongly seen, but seen by the Congress party. In this case, who is saying that the naval mutiny is going to push the British into the sea and out of the country? Whose view is this? So if this is the proposition, in fact, it can be argued. Sir, your book is very rich, but it can be argued that when Patel and people are saying, don't let this mutiny go further, uh, in fact, we can ask the organizers if they can give us mics so that there can be a discussion, as should be in a seminar. So, okay, everybody has a mic. So, I'm, I'm starting off with this question, and then we'll have them from the floor. That in this case, what is the clinching evidence that it is the last battle? In fact, it can be seen, um, and you know, this is where historians put in context, that after 1945, when G.D. Birla comes back from his London visit, he speaks to Gandhi and the other people, and he says, basically, the British are going to go. Now, if the British are going to go, why would the Congress leadership want the Navy to be compromised? If the fight is over, why do you want to fight? This is an essential question to ask. Do the Congress leaders think that the British are not going to go at this time? If they feel a battle is unnecessary, why would they want to support the naval mutiny? So what is the clinching evidence that somebody sees this as the last battle? Second, uh, General Singh, you see, if you say that uh, it is the Jabalpur mutiny which caused the British to leave, that again is a problematic uh, proposition. There is the Viceroy, Lord Wewell, says that there is likely to be a great deal of unrest in India. He writes to the king, that is the quotation which you showed, that there will be great unrest. The result of this, that the Viceroy is pressing the panic button, is that he gets fired almost immediately. So he is there to run the country, not to press alarm bells. They sack him, which means that the political leadership of Britain does not agree with his assessment. And they send Mountbatten, who conducts the transfer of power from India as a brilliant public relations exercise. So that we fight each other, but the British become quite popular. Mountbatten is popular. So there again, 
the, what is the clinching evidence that this actually, the man who is giving this kind of evidence is actually fired for what is seen as his political incompetence. When we are speaking about the Irish Connaught Rangers mutiny, surely the fact that these people are stationed in India must have some influence on them. Now, what is that influence and where is the evidence for that influence? Uh, it must be there somewhere, but do we get a glimmering of it? Further question, which is just a, in history, many times sources are not there for, but if he's executed, who executes him? You know, if one private is executed, because after all, getting one man to kill another is not a, uh, and that to an execution, so who actually carries this out when there is a small contingent? That would be a question of interest, but sometimes we, the sources give us answers, sometimes they do not. So I'm starting this off, and after that, um, questions would be welcome from others. So first of all, why is the book called Last War of Independence, if I understand? Now, there are, there's one evidence that we share, and that is also in the book, the uh, correspondence between Wavell and, and King George. Uh, and I don't need to, I don't want to repeat that, but it very clearly said, said that, look, it's time that we leave. They, six months ago, and look, the book was written you know, good, several decades after, they had, after it happened. So a lot of evidence came up. And there was something just six months ago, um, some records have been opened where there is a um, uh, Viceroy of Babel talks to, uh, 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 writes to Attlee, uh, saying, giving in, de in full detail that look, uh, uh, 1857 did not have the kind of public support that, it, that 1946 has. And therefore, um, the, 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 the Indian um, soldiers have even were reluctant to fire um, on, on their brethren. They, we are much fewer in number as compared to the number of uh, uh, the, the chorus there, which is there for the, for the freedom. And therefore, we will be, we could be butchered if, if there is a, uh, this is all on record, which has just come out. Now, there's something else that I have read in four or five books, but I don't have a, I mean, there is no evidence uh, from the primary source, is that when Atli came in, um, in the mid-50s to, to, to India, he was in Calcutta, sitting next to him was the chief uh, acting governor, who was also the chief uh, justice of the Bengal High Court, that was Justice uh, Chakravarti. And as a matter of conversation, Justice Chak Chakravarti asked Atli, what do you think was the effect of, uh, of Gadiji on, on really uh, getting us freedom? Uh, towards the end, that's after 1942, quit India. Um, he, said, he said in his typical uh, language, he said, minimal. It was, the, it was the armed forces that we were more worried about. And so there are evidence like that. I mean, uh, and, and uh, this is how my inference came up. Sir, sir, I appreciate that. I just have to inform the audience, you know, I'm told that the military band has to be got together. So these are the constraints with which we work. Um, and therefore, while there would be much to be talked about, and Absolutely. this is, you know, in an ideal situation, um, Mr. Kapoor has said various things. We would then bring counter evidence into play, and we would have a rich discussion on this, as would Dr. Atwal and as would General Singh. But what can we do? A band has to play. So we will leave the last two words, and I, I will not intervene I'll just then. just say one, to, one line, I would say, that the British were shaken up but as a result of the mutinies that were taking place. And on the 18th of February, when the mutiny began, that very day, they discussed, they actually had the date of the Crips Commission, uh, Cabinet Mission coming to India. It was all in the newspaper on the 18th of February itself. You see, sir, I, I can't now resist saying no, I know. this. I'm no, sorry, no, I, no, 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 I can't resist saying this. You see, the idea that Cabinet Mission was plan was caused by the naval mutiny was put forward by Rajni Pamdat in the 1946 book, India Today. Later on, when the documents were revealed, it was shown that the cabinet mission was planned before the naval mutiny. So this is where we have hypotheses and we have evidence. Uh, yeah, 
So, so the cabinet mission was on the anvil. The quote from Wavell to King George, that is in the 1983 textbook of Sumit Sarkar, which all the undergraduates uh, studied for many years. And there is a counter to it. So there is a lot of this to and fro, which is actually the interesting part of history. But, um, but General Singh and then uh, Dr. Atwal, please. Say something. Uh, if, you, if you would, because the band is about to play, so you, can, <laughs> you must play before the band, sir. Oh, I know. But uh, what I'd like to say, uh, yeah, there was a mutiny in the Navy. At that time, the Indian Navy was a minuscule force. Not a single aircraft carrier, not a single cruiser, not a single submarine, two frigates. The Royal Navy could have wiped it out in one day. Indian Army was two and a half million strong. At that time, 25 lakhs was the strength of the Indian Army. It was no matching force in the whole world at that time. And the British were controlling the whole of South Asia because of the Indian Army. That is why the, you know, unrest in the Indian Army was taken so seriously. There is no doubts about it. There, sir, there is no doubt about it. You are correct. But again, to toss the idea in the air. You see, we say unrest in the Army, British feel they have to go. The other viewpoint is, once the British say we are going, mm -hmm. there will automatically be unrest because why will people be loyal to a departing power? So, no. you know, this is the whole issue of exactly. how, how one approaches the historical subject. So, uh, like you said, uh, you know, what Wevel was not sacked, Wevel had, what, the date he had recommended that we can't last in India till more than mid-48, uh, he was removed and Mountbatten came next day and announced the same date, June 48. So they, they, it is just, the, it is a personal, uh, this thing between Attlee and yeah. this thing. After Wevel left, when Mountbatten came, he says, okay, June 48 is the date of it. They, they said Indian, And later he pre it. They said Indians worship the rising, not the setting sun. Yes. This was their, Dr. Atwal. Okay, uh, very quickly. Uh, no, I think uh, they already... They would have probably known, but they were most dissatisfied with the treatment the Irish were given in, in, in Ireland. Uh, so that was one reason. And they would have known about the local contacts. Uh, we are not sure because the drawings, actually the sketches show relationship. That they knew what was happening in England, but not, you know, so they were cut off from probably. We have no evidence really. I think we need to generate some. Records, And the other very quick thing is that um, in case of uh, the, your second question was about uh, no, what was uh, the, 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 the who executed. Uh, there's, a, there's somebody called Colonel Vandeleur who actually issues an order. There's a written record of that. But there's a commander in chief who actually uh, says that, you know, it, uh, the commander in chief of the Connaught Rangers who actually sends this up. Um, as a problem, as in gets this notified to the higher authorities. I mean, uh, also the, there is some bit of uh, fact that uh, the mother appeals uh, to the, uh, uh, again, the superior, superior authority that we would, would you please commute the sentence? And there's an order from the vice Roy to the secretary of state that it cannot be done. Which, which leaves the question, is, it, is the execution by a white man or a brown man? We will close this now. And I think I apologize to the audience, which was not able to get in its questions. Let us give a hand to the speakers.